uh, let me welcome you on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, our offices from Stockholm and Vienna. Our discussion today will focus on the OSCE Swedish chairpersonship on expectations and contributions from Sweden as well as from Germany. My name is Gabriela Baumann and I'm responsible for the KRS Nordic countries. I would also like to introduce my colleague Claudia Crawford, who represents KRS Vienna and the Foundation's Project for Multilateral Dialogue. Welcome. Claudia and I look back to a very successful cooperation after 2014, when I was working in Ukraine for the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and Claudia in Moscow. Our projects were meant to strengthen democratic actors. At that time, we launched regular meetings over a period of five years among experts from Ukraine and Russia. The intention was to find trust and to elaborate on expert solutions, which could be shared with decision makers in both countries. The aim was to find an exit scenario out of the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. At least it was possible over a significant period of time to discuss different opinions. I well remember that in the beginning, it was not easy for Ukrainians to even speak with Russians as the country has lost so many lives through separatists backed by Russia and Russian soldiers. The Russian-Ukrainian conflict is unfortunately going on until today and it's not the only protracted conflict in the region. The OSCE has taken an active part in the region with its special monitoring mission. But the question of course is if there is any chance for a long lasting ceasefire and a political solution of the conflict. Besides, we have got recently an escalating security situation in Nagorno-Karabakh and an extremely stressful scenario in Belarus, just to name two other conflict areas. It completes the broad picture of huge challenges for the OSCE and Sweden's chairpersonship this year. The OSCE is regarded as one of the few remaining multilateral communicators between the East and the West, but also divided when it comes to a clear vision of a value-based security community. It has of course gained more attention due to the recent return of major conflicts inside Europe. The annexation of Crimea, again Ukraine by Russia and the military intervention in Eastern Ukraine, which has happened exactly seven years ago, was much worse than what we could expect. To rebuild trust within the OCE and for European security is of utmost importance and urgency. That is why our first speaker of today is uh, Petra Lerke. She is the head of the task force for the Swedish OSCE chairpersonship. Petra Lerke has been working with the Swedish foreign minister ministry since many years, among others, as deputy chair of European security policy. And she has deep regional expertise also on Eastern Europe. Um, after um, Petra Lerke, the next speaker will be Ian Ant Anthony. He is director at CIPRI's European Security Program. And some of his um, expertise, subject expertise are arms control, disarmament and threat reduction. He also has a deep regional expertise on Europe and Russia and also on um, China. And then later I will, I will uh, forward, give the floor to, to Claudia Crawford and she will introduce uh, Charlotte von Friedenberg. So first I would like to, um, start with um, Petra Lerke. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you also for inviting me to this important discussion on the OSC and the Swedish chairpersonship. As was pointed out by the invitation three months into the chairpersonship, this is now a good time both to reflect on what we have achieved so far but also having a view towards the rest of the year and what we want to be able to reach uh, 
before uh, we uh, convened the Stockholm Ministerial Council uh, meeting of the OSCE in December. As you know, uh, chairing the OSCE is a big undertaking. Among the 57 participating states, there are few issues on which there is a consensus. Although solutions to challenges in the OSCE area are difficult to achieve, the tools to do it are already at our disposal. The commitments that the participating states of the OSCE have made under the European Security Order contain all the elements we need to address these challenges. Among other things, it clearly states that the sanctity of sovereignty, uh, territorial integrity, the freedom from threat or use of force, and the right of all states to choose their own security policy path. It also requires all participating states to respect democratic principles and fundamental freedoms. And by making these commitments our first priority as chair, we want to create a good basis for dialogue with all participating states. Both Sweden and Germany know that societies where human rights are fully enjoyed by all are more secure and have better prospects for sustainable, resilient and prosperous development. Uh, but um, um, uh, sorry, I, I saw a comment there, so I sort of lost my track. Uh, um, we therefore seek to strengthen the OSCE's unique comprehensive concept of security, which makes a clear link between security and the respect for human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Through these priorities, we want to contribute to the OSCE's role in resolving conflicts in the OSCE region. During the three first months as chair, uh, much focus has therefore been placed on the conflicts and dialogue with stakeholders in support of the OSCE conflict resolution formats. As the crisis in and around Ukraine remains the most serious challenge to the security, uh, European security order, it was important for the first CIO visit to go to Kiev and the contact line in Donbass back in January. Seven years into the crisis, efforts towards conflict resolution need commitment from all parties, especially from Russia. The full implementation of the Minsk agreements require the active engagement of all parties involved in the Normandy format and the trilateral contact group. We seek to contribute to a sustainable political solution in line with the OSCE commitments and principles respecting the sovereignty, territorial integrity and independence uh, of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. The special monitoring uh, mission is essential to the peace efforts and must remain unimpeded throughout Ukraine. The conflict also has dire humanitarian consequences. The ceasefire, which is enforced since uh, July of last year, needs to pave way for further steps to ease the burden on civilians. Recent violations of the ceasefire are therefore deeply worrying. As long as crossing points of the contact line remain closed, communities and families are separated, elderly struggle to receive care and access to government services, which is restricted for many citizens during this time of conflict. As chair, we want to contribute to these tangible issues that make a difference for people and support confidence building that is needed to make uh, progress also in the conflict. In her meetings with the president and prime minister in Georgia, when she, uh, where she traveled next, CIO Linda reiterated the full support for the Geneva international discussions and related incident prevention and response mechanism formats. She also visited the um, one of Georgia's administrative boundary lines in its conflict context, where the need for increased contacts and com communication between local communities was obvious. In her visit to Moldova, CIO Linda discussed the prospects to move forward with talks in the 5 plus 2 uh, format and to continue building on the Berlin Plus package. This message was generally well received, also by the representative from Trans Transnistria. Although we remain realistic, there may be some cause for cautious optimism 
uh, to make progress on the settlement process during the year. But to make progress, full support of all parties to the conflict is needed, including, of course, Russia. The unresolved Nagorno-Karabakh conflict remains a serious challenge to the international peace and security. The ceasefire, which was achieved in November with the assistance of Russia, brought about welcome stop to his hostilities. We now want to support and renew efforts towards a lasting peace agreement. In, and in her visits to Baku and Yerevan, CIO Linda reiterated the need for a sustainable political solution to the conflict. The OSCE has the international mandate to lead this process under the auspices of the OSCE Minsk Group co-chairs. The humanitarian needs resulting from the conflict is a reminder of the need for implementation of international humanitarian law in this as well as in other conflict areas. In situations where trust between states has eroded, confidence and security building measures play an important role to support transparency and predictability. Although in need of updates, the Vienna document and the Open Skies Treaty remain important tools to achieve this. We therefore regret that the US uh, decided to leave the Open Skies Treaty Mm -hmm. And we continue to play an active role in discussions to resolve the issues concerning Russian implementation of the treaty. We do, of course, warmly welcome the strong engagement of the Biden administration for multilateral cooperation and look forward to close cooperation on issues concerning confidence and security building measures. When crises erupt, Despite our efforts to prevent them, we are also ready to engage directly with the stakeholders involved to offer OSCEs good offices to facilitate solutions. Therefore, the offer that Albania and Sweden extended last year to facilitate a genuine dialogue between the government and opposition in Belarus still stands. This is fully in line with our efforts to support Belarus as a participating state to live up to its commitments. We also know that the opposition supports this offer as a way to indicate the continued engagement of the international community in the situation in Belarus. During this last year, we have seen a black backsliding of democracy and respect for human rights in the OSCE region in the wake of the pandemic. This further strengthens the need for us to emphasize the right to the freedom of expression and the freedom of media as well as to other democratic rights. As chair, our efforts will be carried out in support of and be complementary to the important work done by the autonomous institutions, the ODIR, the representative of the freedom of the media and the High Commissioner for National Minorities. Civil society plays a unique role in the OSCE to support all aspects of comprehensive security. CIO Linde has therefore made it a point of she has made it a point to regularly meet with the civil society organizations uh, from across the OSE region during her field with visits and before important meetings. This is to get a broader perspective on the issues at hand. The meetings have clearly highlighted the need to involve civil society organizations in conflict resolution and peace building to engage women also in all parts of peace processes and to address threats to civil society actors. To support our focus on women, peace and security, an advisory group of experts has been formed, which held its first meeting at the end of February. Looking ahead for the months to come, the CIO will continue with an active travel schedule to visit and to support OSCE field presence in across our region from southeastern Europe to Central Asia to follow up on the essential work that they are um, doing in support of security in our region. During the summer, focus will gradually shift towards the negotiations for decisions at the ministerial meeting in December. We are, of course, realistic on what can be achieved in terms of decisions at the Stockholm MC where we will seek decisions to support the priorities that I have outlined in this speech and that we've been clear with from the outset. Equally important for us 
uh, as decision was, will therefore be to make an impact in the way that the OSC operates throughout the year. This will be done through continuous involvement of civil society, through focused efforts on all levels of the OSC to work with the uh, Women, Peace and Security agenda, and through supporting the autonomous institutions in executing their mandates. Through this approach, we hope to be, make a lasting contribution to European security. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to our discussions. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, uh, Petra Lerke, for, for your input and, um, and out outlining what, what has been done uh, during the last uh, 100 days and uh, what can be done also in order to enhance uh, the security and confidence building measures in, uh, in the future. Thank you again. And Ian Anthony, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to join this discussion because um, I think it's, it's necessary as well as useful to draw attention to some of the characteristics of the OSCE um, that make it an essential element of the European security discourse. So any opportunity to do that, I think, is very welcome. Um, to begin with, it's an essential platform because it brings together countries which are not like-minded, or at least not necessarily like-minded. So the discourse has a different character from the discussions, for example, within the EU or within NATO. So this bringing together of, of countries that don't necessarily see eye to eye as a value per se, and this persistent dialogue is necessary. But also the OSCE has always had this multifaceted approach to security, which is reflected across the three baskets. And I think this is also a very valuable characteristic um, of the organization because it allows the linkages between the three baskets also to be discussed. So the organization is necessary um, and it needs to be supported. But Sweden's taken on the task of chairing at a moment when we can feel the, the ground moving beneath our feet in all of these different dimensions in a way which is unusual and I think profound. Um, so I think some of the changes which we're seeing um, are not normal crises, but they're indicating to us that there are some fundamental issues which have to be addressed. So in the, if you take the politico-military context, for example, um, as has already been said, we now see conflicts, major conflicts, at fairly regular intervals in the OSC region. So now we've had Nagorno-Karabakh, we've had Ukraine, before that Georgia. So these are not one-off isolated events. We're seeing something of a pattern emerging mm -hmm. of every five or six years, one of these major conflicts erupting. But at the same time, we're also seeing a situation where a Europe-wide conflict um, is no longer excluded. In fact, it's a planning assumption, which is why we're seeing the increase in um, spending on the military going up across Europe. Uh, so we have um, a fragmented political military environment. Mm -hmm. And the instruments that uh, we have to address this situation were actually shaped by the strategic conditions of the late 1980s and early 1990s. And they don't really take into account the military realities that we face today. Um, if we think about the human rights and democracy context, again, um, the phrase that we often hear now in meetings is that we've seen back, backsliding on um, some of the principles. But I'm not sure this really captures the degree to which um, events are, are having profound impact. You know, just to take a couple of examples of major countries. If you look at Russia and Belarus, the degree of political instability in the last few months is something we haven't seen since the early 1990s. Yeah. This is not a normal type of situation. And if you look at the United States, you have militias with an organized chain of command coming to events with semi-automatic weapons, uh, which have led to confrontations, loss of life. This is something we haven't seen since the 1960s. So I'm not sure backsliding quite captures the, the degree of the change. Uh, of course, it's also true that we have this fragmented picture um, in the sense that we have challenges to judicial independence, the changing role of the media and shifting informational landscape. So again, a fragmented picture, but rather profound changes uh, taking place that we don't fully, I think, understand or have a vocabulary yet to discuss. 
And in the economic basket or in economic and environmental basket, perspectives on what we thought were settled issues um, are now to a certain extent being overturned. Um, our thinking about government debt, um, money supply, inflation, um, the balance between government intervention and free market, the post-pandemic response has turned all of these assumptions upside down at a time when geoeconomics are modifying the approach that we thought we'd settled towards global interdependence and economic globalization. So across all of the different parts of the OSC um, integrated approach to security, the changes are really profound. Um, and that's the conversation which we need to be having. These are not details. So I think, um, I'm not sure to what extent we should go into this because I suppose it steps outside the OSCE, but um, one of the factors which I think is beginning to show itself across all of these dimensions inside the OSCE area is the role of China as a global factor. Because it's present now across all aspects of international activity and that's something which is only going to increase. But we have no real structure and in fact no agreement on how to address the implications of the rise of China. Um, it's tempting to say this is not an OSCE issue, but um, I'm not sure to what extent you can address those other baskets um, without at least taking into account the impact that China is having on international affairs, and global affairs. Um, perhaps it's better to leave it there and then talk a little bit about and what is to be done um, in the next stage of our conversation rather than uh, trying to lay out all of those things now. But I think three things in general sense need to be done simultaneously. And that's the challenge for Sweden and Germany really, um, to defend the key principles and norms as Petra has said is necessary, um, to, st to strengthen the instruments that the OSC has at its disposal. That's an overdue conversation about the, the role of, of um, OSC missions, special representatives, the different specialized organization institutions and to manage change, to, to have a discussion about how to manage profound change. And those three things have to be done simultaneously. So it's, um, it's a major task which the, which the Swedish colleagues took on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, that was very, very interesting, very deep analysis and lots of thoughts. We will now get into the discussion, but uh, uh, I would also like to remind everyone, because we have almost 60 participants, that you can have uh, questions in the chat. But now, Claudia, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Gabby. Um, I would also like to warmly welcome you to our discussion today. It's a great pleasure for me to moderate now this discussion. The program Multilateral Dialogue of the Conrad Arno Foundation started in December 2018. So we are rather new program here in Vienna and our aim is strengthening value-based multilateralism and a very important instrument to do so is dialogue. So therefore I'm very happy to have this conversation today. And also from my side, uh, Thank you very much, Ms. Ambassador Lerke and uh, Dr. Anthony for this really very good introduction into the topics we have to, to discuss and the, the challenges we, we face. I'm, I'm happy now to welcome also Mrs. Trollet from Friedeburg. Thank you very much for joining our discussion today here. Mrs. von Friedeburg is deputy head of the OCE desk at the German Foreign Office. She started her career at the Foreign Office in 2005 with assignments in Berlin and Washington, among others. While in Berlin, she focused mainly on EU coordination and in 2019 and 20, she was the desk officer for Sweden, Denmark and Finland. So it's, it's very well to have you here today. And so let me ask you, how can Germany supports the representation of Sweden. Thank you very much for having me. That's, uh, um, we've heard a few very important points already from Petra Lerk and Ian Anthony, of course. Now, Germany absolutely stands behind the Swedish chair and its priorities. And we're very grateful for the trustful 
relationship we enjoy with Sweden as a like-minded partner. And, and Germany commends Sweden's efforts in all three dimensions, especially the good work to promote the women, peace and security agenda and gender equality in the OECE. The Swedish foreign minister and CIO has already visited all conflict regions very early on in the year. And, and that's really an achievement um, despite all the logistical problems posed by the pandemic. I hear she's also going to travel to Central Asia in April to all five countries. That's amazing, really. Um, now, in the everyday business, really, the German-Swedish OECE cooperation happens mostly between representatives in Vienna, but also um, when we need it and when there are issues, and most of the time there are, between capitals. So, um, in fact, we encouraged, um, Germany encouraged Sweden very early on to take on the OECE chair in 2021. And we're immensely glad that you are there now to steer the organization through really challenging times. Ian Anthony already um, mentioned the challenges. So the, the first challenge we see is the principles which participates participating states committed to in Helsinki and Paris that being questioned by some. That's a matter of real concern. And I think Germany and Sweden were really like-minded allies when it comes to defending human rights, rule of law, democracy, and the freedom of opinion. And we're joined, and I think that's important because it's encouraging, we're joined by the vast majority of participating states. There are a few who are not quite there and they're very vocal, but the vast majority is in favor of the, the Paris commitments. The second challenge I see is that um, there are some participating states who try to paralyze the organization, often in order to make point on one specific conflict, but they will take over even totally unrelated issues. And Sweden is undertaking every effort, I know, um, to address such obstructionist behavior, but it's a really tough fight. Um, and in view of all those difficulties, I think it's very important um, to realize that um, the chair is not alone. There's the Troika, there are the new heads of the institutions, there are institutions like the Parliamentary Assembly, and there are numerous like-minded partners who will stand ready to support Sweden as the chair. And as its third challenge, there's still the pandemic. Um, obviously there are good side effects, otherwise we wouldn't be having a discussion between Sweden and Vienna and Berlin just over lunch. But, um, but apart from that, the OCE really needs those personal meetings to build trust and, and to allow for dialogue and confidence building because you always need human beings that I think that um, the Albanian ambassador mentioned you need the personal touch and that's quite true you can't build trust with somebody you've never even met in person and just somebody you see through endless zoom meetings we're all going through this one excluded uh, excluded of course so um, I just hope the pandemic will loosen its grip eventually. And I do hope that we will all be able to travel to Stockholm in December for the Ministerial Council. Thank you. Thank you so much, especially on the last point. I will get back later on because this is, of course, a crucial question how to do diplomacy in times of pandemic. Uh, what we heard till now uh, makes clear on one hand that the Sweden third person uh, ship has very ambitious goals. And I think for everybody, it's, it's, it's really um, right to prioritize, to getting back to the principles, back to basics, uh, those mm -hmm. values, those principles you see was, was built on. On the other hand, and especially Ian Anthony made it very, very clear, we face a lot of challenges and not only new challenges for years already. Uh, the OCE not always met its goal. It, it should 
achieve. So we have a lot of obstacles. It was already mentioned, the, the conflict in Eastern Ukraine, but we have all the conflicts even, which are not solved so far. We have still the frozen conflicts, sometimes become even hot conflicts again. So taking this into account, I would really like to ask you, Mrs. Uh, Ambassador Lerke, which instruments you will use, Sweden will use to overcome all these blockages and, and obstacles. What are the next steps? You already mentioned what you have done in the first 100 days and, and we see that you uh, take this representation very, very serious. But are there the instruments you would need and how you can use them, please? Thank you, Claudia, and thank you also to the other panelists uh, for their introductions. Uh, very useful for us as, as chairs. Um, you asked about the instruments to, to make progress on the conflicts, uh, especially. And I think what, what I tried to outline in my briefing was the fact that the minister or CIO Linda takes the conflicts very seriously and she really wants to make some sort of difference and, and make a, a contribution to European security. That's why she started off by visiting all of the conflict areas, uh, the, the countries hosting conflicts in the OSC area. Of course, now we need to be working on the sort of um, the small steps uh, that can be achieved in these conflicts. You know that uh, the special the the chair person or the chair of the OSC has to its uh, uh, availability um, special representatives and personal representatives to all of these conflicts. And the Foreign Minister Linda is in close contact with these these uh, special representatives who represent her in the negotiation formats uh, that are ongoing. You know that in Eastern Ukraine, it's the trilateral contact group. In uh, Moldova, it, there's the five plus two format that I referred to where we have a special representative, uh, German uh, national, by the way, Mr. Thomas Meyer-Harting. Uh, in in uh, Georgia, there's uh, the Geneva International Discussions uh, where uh, former State Secretary Annika Söder is a special representative. And in, in um, the conflict uh, uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan regarding Nagorno-Karabakh, there's the personal representative, Andrei Kasperzik, who represents uh, the chair, uh, but there's also the Minsk group, group co-chairs. So in all of these conflicts, uh, the CIO has very close contacts with these people, and we are certainly working on how to design confidence building measures or indeed uh, inject momentum into the negotiations. And, and we, are working constantly on on what such um, yes sorry <laughs> sorry I I, I mistook uh, he, he speaks German <laughs> I, I see a comment from uh, Stephanie Lichtenstein uh, in the uh, comment field um, uh, yeah so we are um, we are constantly working on these uh, negotiation formats and hoping to make uh, progress but let's all be realistic about what can be achieved I I think you mentioned Claudia that some of these conflicts have been around for for dec decades already so um, we are we are we are realistic but we are also ambitious so um, i think that's as much as i can tell you for the time being yeah thank you uh, dr anthony you already mentioned very briefly three to do's maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on this do you see a way realistically for returning to the basic principles of the OST. Um, I think that's a question which obviously requires high level political engagement because that's the only way we'll get there. So um, I think the task is really to organize the instruments that the OSC has at its disposal along two vectors, horizontally and vertically. So horizontally, to bring together the different instruments, whether it's special representatives, field operations, um, the activities in the specialized institutions, 
to produce a coherent picture, which can then be transmitted vertically to the highest possible political level in a way that they can um, absorb and make use of when they have so much else on their plate with the pandemic, with the economic situation, with other domestic issues um, and other high level strategic issues. So I think that's the, the task is to find that horizontal connection between the different parts of the OSCE to produce an information package which can facilitate a top level political dialogue because that's the top level political dialogue is the only way you're going to resolve the, the fundamental question. So um, I think that's the task is to see how those um, connections can be made horizontally and vertically. And that's something which I think actually deserves a, a special analysis and a special examination. Yes, thank you. I, I believe you are right. Uh, you need political will at first hand to achieve these, your goals. Uh, one conflict was already mentioned uh, in Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, uh, and a, a more recent military conflict, but already uh, going on for seven years. Germany is part of the Normandy format. They, where my question to you, Mrs. von Friedeburg, is there any potential together with the OEC to enhance the contribution to the conflict resolution in the next few months? Is there a possibility to create this political will, uh, which we are mentioned right now? Thank you. Well, I think we have the instruments that were mentioned already, at least partly that we have the Normandy format, which is closely interlinked with the trilateral contact group. And uh, I mean, the Normandy for set up the political framework and then the contact group under the leadership of OCE special representative Heidi Gau is tasked to fill that out by facilitating concrete decisions and the implementation. Um, and she's also present at most of the meetings of the N4 coordinators. Um, but as Dr. Anthony said, it's all a question of political will. Um, and that, that can't be substituted. The other very important tool that we have is obviously the, the OECE special monitoring mission on the ground. They are the eyes and ears of the international community and they're the only international mission I think that have uninhibited access to the non-government controlled areas. So we need them for the monitoring of the ceasefire and for the implementation of the MINS to verify, I mean, to monitor the implementation of the Minsk agreements. But we also need them to facilitate dialogue on the ground between the sides. And dialogue is only going to be meaningful if you have a political will on both sides. I think both um, Sweden and Germany and many other participating states support the SMM. We have 38 staff members that we second between them. Um, Deputy Head of Mission, Antje Grave, who's also in charge of the human dimension work of the SMM, which Sweden has put a special focus on rightly, if we think. Um, so they are there and they can do great work, but they can't solve the conflict by themselves. And the third part, the third tool on the ground we have is the border observer mission stationed at two um, Ukraine-Russian border crossings. And they're very small, but they are, um, it's an interesting blueprint, I think, for how um, border control could look one day, border control by the OCE could look one day when we've managed to make progress with the conflict. Is that going to happen in the next couple of months? We certainly hope so, but there are not many signs that make us confident that it's going to, but we'll, we'll keep up the work, I think. And you will too, Petra Lerk, I know that. Exactly to the SMM you mentioned is the question is a shed I would 
put forward to Ambassador Lerke. What can the Swedish share do in order not to lose the SMM in view of the current budget crisis at non-extension of the mandate with the deadline tomorrow? This was asked from Fred Tanner, please. Well, thank you. And thank you for a very timely question. Indeed, if I was not in this meeting, I would be working on that exact thing right now. It is certainly an issue uh, that is uh, taking up a lot of uh, our time right now to finish the uh, negotiations on the SMM budget for, for the coming year. Uh, we are, I, I don't know whether it has already been announced, but uh, we are looking to hold a, a, um, a PrepCom and a special PC on that issue later on this afternoon in order to be able to, to, um, to continue the um, SMM uh, functioning. Uh, as as usual, and indeed, I mean, these are discussions that are ongoing with participating states uh, at this very moment in order to make sure that we have the the grounds for for consensus. Thank you, because it, it fits well in this part of our discussion. Alexandra Jugovic asked you, Gabi. Um, in your introductionary speech, you said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was much worse than we expected. What are your current expectations regarding Russia and its next steps? Um, yeah, thank you. Just to be very brief, what I, what I uh, was trying to say is uh, that um, nobody really expected that um, uh, Russia would Violate, uh, ter uh, violate uh, territorial sovereignty and and uh, annex uh, a part of another country. So this was uh, very much what I said about about Crimea. We we did not expect that even being uh, being in Ukraine that time that Russia would um, go over to annex um, a part of another country and also uh, later on to. Um, uh, to, to use military forces in order to uh, to um, set up another state of um, the situation uh, in eastern uh, Ukraine, which is now um, uh, uh, yeah de facto de facto uh, um, de facto not belonging to Ukraine anymore because it's not controlled uh, by by Ukraine even if it's a part of Ukraine, but it's not controlled anymore. So we did not expect really it to happen like this, that, like, like that uh, beginning of 2014. What can be the next steps? I mean, this is really very interesting because this is, um, uh, it's an interesting question, but it's hard to say because it's very much uh, depending on what uh, uh, the Russian, um, uh, the Russian uh, policy is actually going to do. And, uh, has to admit, um, of course, itself as a part of the conflict and not as a mediator. Uh, this is what we always uh, are saying. And then you, you have um, you have uh, a counterpart you can you can uh, uh, talk with, but not just uh, someone who is going to be a mediator. Thank you, Gary. The the very old Nagorno-Karabakh conflict has turned from a cold to a hot one. And many fear that the current pacification by Russia will not last. A crisis of a completely different kind, perhaps to be described as a deep internal systemic crisis is currently taking place in Belarus. Both conflicts were mentioned already and they are of such a nature that the question is justified whether the OEC should not be called upon here. Um, Dr. Anthony, is this question justified? Is it realistic? How could the OEC become more involved and what could the OEC do here? I think um, the events in Nagorno-Karabakh are very interesting from that perspective that um, the settlement to the extent that it is a settlement, and I think we have to say it's only an interim settlement, was arrived at through conversations among two or three interested parties with the OSC essentially excluded. Um, so this coming together of small groups of states to address problems on the basis of interest rather than principle 
uh, is not really consistent with the way the OSC would like to approach these things, but I think that's the reality of where we are at the moment. Um, so in terms of what next, if you look at the document, which actually ended the um, immediate fighting, it has some elements which could be extremely interesting if they were developed further, particularly the commitments to invest in transport infrastructure, um, to develop some of the projects which have been talked about for a long time to facilitate Trans-Caspian um, movement of goods. Uh, you, you could, in theory, imagine joint projects because even if Armenia lost the, the conflict, they would still have to be involved in the construction of such infrastructure. You could perhaps see a role there which would bring together this um, uh, perspective across the different OSCE baskets with economic, environmental, conflict management um, dimensions. Um, so I think, I think this is perhaps an area where there could be some practical projects that would re-engage the OSCE, um, which was excluded, in fact, from the actual discussions of how to bring the fighting to a close. Exactly. To, to this question uh, comes a new question from the chat. Uh, still needs a political settlement process. Um, is there a role of the Minsk co-chairs? And uh, Sweden you, is part of, of the Minsk group. Please, maybe Ambassador Lerke, you could take on this question to you. Yes, absolutely. And definitely there is a, a role for the Minsk group co-chairs. Um, the CIO Linda has been very clear about uh, our support for the Minsk Group coaches and for the personal representative of the CIO, Andrei Kasperzik, as I mentioned before. Um, we still to need to see the, uh, the Minsk Group coaches travel to the region in order to, to be able to carry out the work that they have a mandate to do. So definitely <laughs> there is a role. And, and I would agree with what uh, Dr. Anthony Ian just said uh, about how, how, how the... Um, agreement on the ceasefire actually uh, lays out the foundation for some some issues that could be worked further on and I think the, that could be something that both the PRCIO the personal representative of the CIO could be working with as well as, uh, as the co-chairs so I together with the regional um, regional powers um, in the in the southern Caucasus and around, so I think there is there is hope, uh, but we, but there also is of course the need for a lot of political will from both sides uh, if this conflict uh, is ever to be solved, because um, there there is a lot of <laughs> ground still to be covered. Since we are still talking around the first dimension of the OEC, peace and security, I would. I like another uh, question from the chat from Mr. Klaus Prompers or to, uh, to Ambassador Lerke. In the sidelines, open skies is still in jeopardy. Do you expect the Biden administration to come back and motivate Russia to stay on the open skies? Well, thank you. I think that question should be <laughs> directed towards our US colleagues, really. As chairs, we will certainly be working in order to, to maximize the number of uh, participants in the Open Skies uh, Treaty. The Open Skies Treaty is not an OSC treaty per se, but uh, uh, 33 uh, participating states are members of the Open Skies Treaty. So it is well connected with the OSC. And we think that it's part of the um, architecture that makes this region safer and more transparent and uh, gives more predictability about uh, about uh, military and, and other behaviors. So certainly it is something that we bring up in conversations that we are having as, as chairs, both with the Americans, uh, Foreign Minister Linda brought it up in her talk to uh, Secretary of State Blinken already in the beginning of the year. And she has brought it up, of course, in her visit uh, to Moscow when she discussed uh, many OSCE related issues uh, with uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. So yes, it's something we bring up. 
In addition to the dimension of peace and security, Marek Menkechuk uh, asks, while discussing Russian-Ukraine war in Donbass, various concepts of a peacekeeping operation appeared. Most of them related to UN or UN mandated coalition of the willing operation, but some also mention enhanced AC presence while issue of arming of service raised controversies. What's your take on that? So uh, who would like to, to answer this question? So is this still discussed um, in IOC mandate with um, very uh, robust uh, mandate uh, for peacekeeping? Who would like to, to take this question? Ambassador, maybe you. Well, I think right now our focus is on the SMM, as we were discussing uh, just before, on getting our the the one international presence that we do have on the ground that is that doesn't need a new mandate, but that has an existing mandate, and and uh, contributes immensely to to both uh, the security uh, by virtue of, of of just being there, but also the um, humanitarian conditions of the local population since it does indeed in, interga interact and, and engage with the, the, the people uh, that are uh, affected by the conflict. So uh, our focus right now is really on, on how to make best use of the SMM, make sure that the, it continues to have a mandate, but also that it can operate throughout Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. So, so that would be my question, my, my answer. Can I just say, I, I mean, it, to a certain extent, it's a hypothetical question in the sense that such a mandate would require consent and um, to achieve consent in a consensus based organization around that proposal. It's very, very hard to imagine today. Um, so building on the SMM and trying to see what can be done to make sure there's real time situational awareness of what's happening on the ground. Um, that's, I think, a more real question. Uh, Thank you. I, I would close the chapter peace and security dimension and uh, go further to the human dimension, because this is a very, very high priority of the Swedish third person SIP. Uh, you underline the human dimension, human rights, democracy, the rule of law. So even you already mentioned uh, uh, some of the uh, goals you have and instruments you have. Please tell us what kind of activities or initiatives has been already started with the first 100 days and what are the next plans? Ambassador Lerke, please. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, and thank you for underlining the priority that we attach to, to the human dimension. Indeed, it is one of our main goals to work forward, to work to achieve um, progress in the human dimension. And, uh, and I think the, the need has never been greater than now because what we see on top of the sort of democratic uh, backpedaling, there's also the pandemic, which, which uh, has introduced new layers of restrictions on, on democratic freedoms uh, and um, principles. So yes, we, are, uh, we have, as I said, uh, prioritized uh, democratic processes and uh, the freedom of expression, the freedom of media. I think uh, for any share, share personship, uh, the organization of the human dimension implementation meeting is in itself a major, a major task. Uh, it requires a lot of energy, but also the fact that that uh, meeting is held is also a contribution to, to the role of civil society, the interaction between 57 participating states on issues that are extremely uh, well, you know, timely and 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 uh, called for, so uh, that will be one of our uh, main tasks uh, in the human dimension, of course. Uh, and and as you know, it's not uh, uncontended, uh, contested. It's uh, it, there are participating states who have issues with the way that that uh, that meeting is carried out. Uh, so that will be something to focus on. We will also want to focus more on the freedom of expression and the freedom of the media. And we are planning to organize a media, uh, a freedom of the media conference, a digital one uh, later on this spring, in order to 
highlight uh, issues uh, that we think are at risk when it comes to freedom of expression and freedom of the media. Um, so that would be the two things that I would possibly highlight. But then we have a, I mean, we have a human dimension committee that is extremely active. Uh, and and uh, we also see the role of the field missions in this in this field. So so we are, I mean, the, the OSC is always working very in a multi-vector <laughs> style and and uh, way of uh, functioning. So so if I outline to you what the chair is doing, it's complemented by a number. And when I say complemented, I also just want to finish by highlighting the role of the in autonomous institutions, uh, which now with their new leaderships have, uh, I, I, I see how they are really, uh, you know, eager to to take on their tasks and and be fully operational, which they are, uh, in order to to carry out their important mandates. Uh, they have really strong mandates, and and we we support them as much as we can, while also respecting their autonomy. So, so somewhere there. Mrs. Van Friedeburg, would you like to add? What instruments do you see to? better protect human rights and to strengthen democracy in the participating states. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, as Petra Lack has said, I, we also do think it's very important that HDIM can take place this year. And um, obviously it's probably going to be some kind of hybrid format, but it's important that it takes place. And that especially the access of the civil society is unlimited from all countries. Um, and obviously there, not everybody's fond of that. So there's going to be some discussion around the subject. I think on the autonomous institutions, um, they actually also need our support. They've come into these offices and the, the head positions have been vacant for a couple of months and they are, um, I think they're all full of energy and ideas and initiatives, but they need our support, um, especially when they come under attack by some states for the, for a different uh, number of reasons, really. Some, sometimes ODI, I know, is criticized for its methodology in the election observations. And then I think they need um, countries like Sweden and Germany to publicly come to their aid. Um, election observation really is, is very important from our point of view. Um, ODEA has an internationally renowned track record and clearly brings a visible added value to democracy with election observation. Um, we regularly second election observers, which of course is very difficult now during the pandemic. It's, um, there's more security risk um, COVID related and that makes it difficult but I think it's important because at the same time elections also come on democratic elections come under more pressure for different reasons um, I think that I know actually that the new ODEA director has also started uh, working to include modern campaigning and new technologies more into ODEA's uh, method of methodology and that's very important um, and we should also support him in that. So um, I think we should really all participating states that can uh, should um, continue to second observers in the missions and I hope that the pandemic will allow also for short-term observers to return at some point this year. Thank you. The OECE works also in an other area, the so-called second dimension, economic development and environmental protection. Would an increase on the efforts of the OECE in this dimension help to strengthen cooperation between the participating states and therefore also help to create new trust among one another? This fit within question from the chat I also would to like to mention here. There has been very little mention of the second dimension so far. What are the prospects of the second dimension, especially in relation to enhancing connectivity to contribute to resolve the current crisis in the OEC? 
And I would like to forward this question to Dr. Anthony, please. Oh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> um, I think the, these are questions which always have to be brought back to the mandate of the OSCE to discuss security questions. Um, so, of course, we can have a long discussion about how security should be defined in 2021, and it's definitely not the same definition we applied in the 1980s. But the OSCE can't, I think, transform into a forum where all discussions of every topic under the sun are conducted simultaneously. This would be too much. So I think it's identifying those elements of economic security and environmental security um, that can be discussed. This is the task, uh, rather than to have a generic discussion about economics and environment or climate. I think defining economic security, uh, defining environmental security is probably the first task. Do you agree, Ambassador Lerger? Are there plans to, to have new initiatives or projects on, on this second dimension? We can't hear is... you. Yeah. Maybe I could Can just... you hear me now? Oh. Okay. Well, I would agree with uh, Dr. Anthony that uh, it is um, it is relevant uh, to conduct uh, um, activities in the second dimension, especially when it is related to security and, and building of security and trust. And I would say that one of the issues we discussed a bit earlier on, uh, where we discussed uh, how we could work to improve, com well, uh, confidence and uh, confidence building between the parties in the Southern Caucasus region around Nagorno-Karabakh. We discussed the issue of uh, connectivity and uh, logistical projects, infrastructural projects. And I think that is uh, an issue where it's closely, where, where it's really put into light the fact that the OSC manages uh, uh, three different dimensions and, and there are tools for us to use in all of these three. So uh, as Swedish chair, we have a, a number of priorities also in the second dimension. Uh, we have chosen to, to prioritize um, women's economic participation, uh, climate and security, or for that matter, environment and security, but also anti-corruption. And I think all of these issues have strong links uh, to the issue of security and and we will work to to sort of um, to integrate them in and and our overarching priorities into everything that we do. So I think you will see more of our priorities in the second dimension in the months to come. Maybe just to be a bit more concrete about the type of thing I had in mind. Um, if you think about the post pandemic economic conditions, um, the, the pandemic hasn't hit all sectors of society equally. And there are going to be certain vulnerable communities who may be at um, increased risk of, for example, trafficking, um, abuse of labor law, or abuse of labor regulations. Um, this type of topic, it seems to me, is an area where the OSC has already done a lot of very good work, for example, on combating human trafficking. So this is a clear link between um, an economic issue and a security challenge in the human security dimension. Thank you so much. This is really a very good example also to show that all three dimensions more or less belongs to each other and are interconnected. So therefore, I, I would like to get back to the last question on election observing, because there is a new question in the chat from Marek Menkicek. There are all indications September parliamentary elections in Russia will be seriously affected with government-led manipulations. What should be odious policy towards this election, in your opinion? And may I ask uh, you both, uh, Ambassador Lerke and Charlotte von Friedeburg. Well, thank you. Um... First of all, let me say that as chair, we don't want to have any opinions about how the ODR should work. It's an autonomous institution, and we have a strong confidence in uh, Matteo Micacci and all of his team uh, that they will work uh, as diligently as they always do to make sure that the observation is carried out uh, in a 
uh, transparent and efficient manner. I know that uh, Matteo Micacci is already consulting with Russia in order to make sure that this uh, monitoring can happen. And, and we expect it to be as, um, as, uh, as uh, uh, effective as, as, as the ODIR um, election observations often are. Uh, and we also expect Russia, as other participating states, to live up to the recommendations uh, that the ODIR then produces. Uh, this is another important part of the ODIR's mandate. Uh, and uh, and something I think all participating states should, could be a little bit better at, <laughs> following up on the recommendations that the uh, election observation teams leave behind. Please, well, thank you. Second, that really, um, ODEA has an independent and transparent methodology, and they always use that in their election observations. They always make the same reports in every election and, and put out what they've seen. And then in the end, in the final report, they make recommendations. And I expect them to do that in Russia and in every other election this year they're being invited to, including Germany's, by the way. Thank you. Now we discuss all three dimensions um, in a very enhanced way. But as for all organizations, there are, I suppose, you see some practical questions. And one of these very important practical questions is how is the budget? So the OCE has growing duties. Uh, and, and, and challenges um, to deal with. Comparing to this, uh, what can you say about the funding of the OEC and of the instruments? Please, uh, Ambassador. The funding of the instruments. I, I, I am sorry, I didn't really uh, understand the question. I mean, uh, for example, the question we already uh, uh, raised, uh, how to find or how to extend the SMM, there's also a budget question. And I, I remember even in, in the mid of the 2000s, we had the problem that the participating state couldn't agree on a, on, on a budget. And uh, also the question is, is the annual budget also growing in the same way as the duties and, and challenges for the OC are growing? Well, it's certainly a cumbersome process, uh, I must say, having been the chair of the uh, ACMF committee, the one that, uh, that negotiates the uh, annual budget for the OSC. It always takes more time than we have at our hands. Uh, also, the uh, the annual budget needs to be adopted uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we are now into a phase where we will extend the, the 2020 budget for a month, uh, every month, so to speak. Uh, so we would be the first ones to, to, to applaud if there could be a process by which we could come to an understanding uh, uh, more quickly and, and, and have that instrument function even better. I think uh, there it would be, I mean, it would be really uh, a good thing if, if participating states would be concentrating on what is the, what are the issues at hand? How do we make sure that the organization works effectively? And then try to save their questions about uh, political issues, conflict issues, other issues for those negotiations that pertain to that specific matter. I think perhaps that is one of the, uh, things that could be done in order to smoothen up such a, a process, because indeed I think that very few uh, chairmanships or chairpersonships have been able to f finalize the budget negotiations in time, and it's a pity, really. Would somebody like to add something to this specific topic? It's really odd. I'd really like to um, emphasize that point. The problem is 
most often not the budget. The budget hasn't grown for a couple of years. So, um, of course, with the growing tasks of the organization, it, it would be ideal if, it, if there were more money to execute all these tasks and the many more which come up. Um, but the main problem, I think, is that some states um, deny the consensus for unrelated matters. And that has happened with the general budget and it's happening with the SMM budget now. And that is really a problem because it, um, consensus should be consensus based on, on the goodwill of all states to cooperate in the spirit of the organization and in the spirit of dialogue. And if it were that, I don't think that would be a major problem. I think it's easy to say from the outside, but um, I wonder if states shouldn't just take a step back and put this into the broader context where all restrictions on public spending and public borrowing have essentially been eliminated in the last 12 months. And yet in the OSCE context, people argue intensely about a million euros here and a million euros there, when countries are borrowing hundreds of billions of euros. So just to take a step back and, and, and put in context what's being asked for and what could be delivered by really very small amounts. Thank you for all these answers. The main task for the chairpersonship is above all high diplomacy. We already touched upon this topic. Diplomacy requires informal formats, personal contacts, trust among each other. How is that possible under the conditions of the corona pandemic that the life takes place to a large extent in the digital space? What, what are your experience uh, so far, Ambassador Lerke? Well, thank you uh, for that question. It is uh, certainly a challenge. Um, but as I said, uh, CIO Linda has made it her personal uh, priority to, to try and reach out to especially the countries that host conflicts uh, in the OSCE region. And that's why she has, uh, in spite of the pandemic, um, made sure that her travels could be done in a safe manner. Uh, so that she could meet personally with the leaders uh, of these uh, countries uh, in order to establish trust. Of course, once you've met, uh, it's easier to, to take a phone call or a video conference. But, but uh, to say the obvious, I mean, a lot of what we've been doing so far has been done over a Zoom link or a, or a, a WebEx link. Uh, and uh, I think it's something we've all experienced. You, you make do with what you have. And, and I think some really important contacts have been made this way. And we've managed to, to make headway on a number of really hard uh, issues. So while we would have loved to carry out a shepherdsonship uh, that was unaffected by the pandemic, especially uh, from you know, the humanitarian suffering that it is causing every day in, in all of our countries. Uh, we also are, uh, I think this mix that we've tried to set up where uh, we do make some of the travels that are essential in order to make headway on, on conflict that are also uh, causing uh, humanitarian uh, suffering. Um, we also, we have this mix with personal contacts and, and digital diplomacy. And I think um, for now, it's it's actually worked quite well. There is a question from Ambassador Christian Stroher, which fits very well. Can anything be done against abuse of consensus? Can somebody answer this question? It's really difficult, I see. I think the question is a great one, but it might be a little bit difficult to answer that in one minute. I don't think we'd make it in one hour, to be honest. Well, I guess this is not only the question we see, but everywhere we have to take consensus, consensus decision. And this will be a question for all of us. Since the time is running out, I have the last 
um, topic I would like to touch upon to, to round it up our discussion. And it fits very well with the question from Marek Mankitzak. Russia can occasionally raise a slogan of the need for a new European security concept, sort of Helsinki too. Some voices from Europe has been welcoming this controversial concept. What do you think about it? And I would like to add my personal question to this, which is slightly differently. Do you see any opportunity for a new OCE summit? For instance, in 2025, the 15th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Act, aiming at fostering the dialogue among participating states and not aiming Helsinki point two. So please, I would go the round from Ambassador Lerke to Mrs. van Friedeburg and then to you, Dr. Anthony. Thank you, Claudia. And I think our priorities stated cl quite clearly. We want to go back to basics. We don't think there's a need for a European Security Order 2.0. We think that everything we need is in the commitments and principles that we have all agreed to, especially in the Helsinki Final Act and the Paris Charter for a New Europe. So no, I don't think there's a need for a new <laughs> security order, uh, but I do think there is. this is the time to to uh, to invigorate uh, our own uh, the momentum that we have in 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 fulfilling our commitments uh, and um, so anything that can be done in order to 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 make that happen I I I'm sure we would support. Yes, I think that the Finnish president. Uh wrote in an article yesterday in a Finnish newspaper that he invites everybody to Helsinki in 2025. Now that's great, but the, the important thing is what we do until then. Do we among participating states actually achieve to um, together again around the commitments in from Helsinki and Paris? And can we really remake that agreement and that consensus and then we can i think sometimes discuss about how to facilitate even better measures for dialogue and um, and all that but the important thing is that we managed to bring the organization together again and then we can confirm that in a summit but the important thing is the work that's been done that has to be done until then thank you Yes, thank you. Um, I don't think the date should be used in an artificial way because I think that creates more problems than it solves, really. Um, we saw that with the so-called Helsinki plus 40, which turned out to be a bit of a fiasco. Um, so I don't think the date should be the, the determining factor. Um, I also don't think there's a need for a new concept, um, but I think there is a need to open the door for a discussion about how the existing concept is going to adapt to these fundamental changes that I was talking about in the opening presentation. And I think we have to do that with a degree of humility. Um, uh, it can't be carried out on the basis that all of the problems are east of Vienna and all of the solutions are west of Vienna. That's not going to take us in a constructive direction. So I think that dialogue about how we adapt to a very fast changing environment is necessary, but it doesn't require a new concept. Thank you so much for all your answers and the deep insight we uh, could get. Our discussion time came to an end and from my side, I really wish the Swedish chairpersonship all, all success, all support you will need and uh, also the luck, what you always need to succeed. I thank all the panelists, and I also thank very much my colleague uh, Gabriele Baumann and her team in Stockholm for organizing this uh, discussion together. Thank you for all the questions our um, auditorians has raised, and oh, there come just a, a last question from a good friend of mine from Russia. Um, you can see it how we can create more trust between 
uh, Russia and, and um, the West and the other OC members. Um, since the time is an end, uh, I, I just would like to, 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 to answer by my own. We have to, to dialogue um, without giving up our principles. And, and um, sometimes it is also how we talk with each other. And therefore, we hope that we can get back to the normal diplomacy where people can meet and build a new trust. Um, so with these words, for my part, I will like to end, would like to end. And thank you all. And, give back to, to Gabriele, uh, except somebody would like really uh, to answer this last question. Otherwise, Gabriele, please uh, finish you the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Just very, very briefly, because I didn't expect to take any time anymore. Thank you so much for a very interesting uh, contribution and a very interesting um, insight. This topic so i made a lot of notes <laughs> for myself as well and um i'm happy to continue the discussion uh on the OSCE chairpersonship in 2021 and i hope to see at least um, my, my my friends Petra Lerke and Ian Anthony in, in Sweden in Stockholm as soon as possible uh, in person i'm very much looking forward to it and hopefully we will have a um, um a discussion around in presence this year in Stockholm thank you so much Thank you so much, Claudia, as well. It was great. Very good discussion. Thank you. <laughs>